and I'm sure all of you all do this, resting 2D COVID Doppler, routine treadmill stress test, in some indicated cases, dobutamine stress echo or adenosine stress thallium, and 24-hour ambulatory ECG for those patients with arrhythmias. These are the five fundamental easily available, uh, uh, what you call ubiquitously available tests. Most of the centers have this, which should be done in indicated patients. I would believe that a resting 2D echo Doppler should be done in every elderly patient with vascular risk factors. And of course, we'll talk about this when we start the cases. Okay. Uh, Bala, we'll start the first case scenario. Yeah, you yeah, have Before that, I just want to, uh, for benefit of all of us, want to ask you regarding uh, when we discussed on the blood pressure, uh, we thought if it's an elective procedure, uh, it's best to have 140 by 90. Uh, in few conditions, especially in the geriatric population, we have the isolated uh, systolic Sorry. hypertension yeah. of the elderly, and uh, especially when they cross 80s. So what do you think uh, should be our criteria in this age group? That's what, uh, it's a good question you just brought. Actually, all of us tended to believe at one point that since elderly can, can have, they do have isolated systolic hypertension and they may be left with, with that blood pressure, which is not true. SHEP trial, elderly trial, HOT trial, and HOT2 trial all have proven that even in elderly who are going for a major non-cardiac surgery, the systolic has to be maintained below 140 pre-op. That is the best bet that perioperative myocardial ischemia doesn't... This I am talking in context of coronary disease to avoid the perioperative myocardial ischemia. So there is no such separate cutoff limit for the elderly. Okay, so that's a very valid point because yes. uh, if they come with a pressure of 200 yes. by uh, 90 or 200 by 80, uh, if we go by the text textbook descriptions that we need to get the systolic less than 30% of the preoperative level and it becomes like still it will be more than 140. So that's why I thought we should clarify mm. this point uh, from the cardiology point of view. Sure. And I think now it's very clear that in spite of the age, in spite of the isolated systolic hypertension of the elderly, it's best to try to achieve 140-90 in all the age population. Majority, of the, majority yes. of the patients. The second question which I would like to ask before we be going into the case scenario is, uh, many times, especially uh, in trauma, in geriatric trauma, considering that's one of the commonest, uh, uh, you know, aid in, the, in this geriatric age group, apart from myocardial infarction and malignancy, the commonest thing that they come to the hospital is after it fall and having a hip fracture. What happens is in these patients, they come with very high pressures because of uh, the pain that is associated with that. So uh, one of the uh, things which I wanted to uh, bring for discussion is when you see an isolated one reading of blood pressure of uh, 200 by 100. And uh, suppose if you take, uh, no, uh, like in the presence of pain, uh, any antihypertensives takes a very long time to get the pressures down. What do you think about the concept of, for example, if they have a hip fracture, on arrival you give a femoral block. And you get the, because once the patient's pain relief is there, you get the pressures down. And uh, invariably we see that after a block and when the VAS score becomes less, the pressures also come down. The sympathetic overactivity sure. is less. So do you think that it could be advocated that instead of just relying on one blood pressure and postponing the case, do you think it will be a good idea to give a pain relief, sure. which is very good? check the pressures again, and then try to take the uh, patient yeah. as early as possible for a surgical procedure in this group of patients. Sure, absolutely. Uh, see, geriatric patients who come with, let us say, fracture neck femur with, with a accidental fall in the bathroom or something like that, there are a lot of factors which play. Pain is the most important parameter. Second is the anxiety of coming to the hospital. They may not have, when they may not have seen the hospital ever there in their, in their life, you know. And then these two factors increase the blood pressure. So in the olden days, we used to talk about post-operative analgesia. Now we talk about perioperative analgesia. So we start with pre-operative analgesia, relieve anxiety, and this itself will, you will achieve some 30, 40 millimeters of systolic drop in blood pressure. And then three or four hours down the line, you will find the patient relatively very safe and stable to be wheeled into the theater. That's very, very, very correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's uh, one thing which uh, we want to clearly define because in a day-to-day -day practice, we should never postpone a case just by one recording and saying that cardiology opinion, physician's opinion, and just wash away the hands. I think we need to go one step further because eventually we want this patient to go home. It's, it's our baby. I think the day we de decide that 
every patient is our patient and it's not the surgeon's patient, there is this small shift in the attitude makes a huge difference in the outcome. Uh, so so we can, can we start? Yeah, we'll start yeah. the case. Yeah. This is a case scenario. Uh, this is one of uh, our orthopedic uh, surgeon's patients. 64-year-old uh, female, diabetic for the last six years, history of anteroceptal myocardial infarction three years ago, was treated conservatively because of age. She has class 2 very stable angina, but she can do most of the domestic activities very well, including washing dishes at times. So she is met, met in terms of met, she is around 6 mets, activities very without angina. Canadian cardiovascular class 2 as we call it. The ECO shows an ejection fraction of 40% with type 2 B diastolic dysfunction. She is taking aspirin, ramipril and monotrate. And, no, and now is diagnosed to have fracture neck femur. Now this is the case scenario. I, I asked the audience after this, what do you make out of this case scenario? What do you think? What are the, what are the, what are the catch points here? Look at this. What do you read out of this data available? She can have triple vessel coronary artery disease underneath because she has never been studied. She was treated conservatively. She is a diabetic remember and who has a myocardial infarction at the age of 61. She is 64 now. So obviously she could have a triple vessel disease. She has type 2 diastolic dysfunction meaning there is a poor margin, very poor margin to give fluids, volume. Somebody else, somebody in the audience, was, yes you are there, asking me yesterday what does the diastolic dysfunction mean? Type 2, type 1 is safe. Type 1 is almost all, all, all elderly people will have. Type 2 and B is an unsafe type where the mo rapid volume you give, they land up in pulmonary edema. Elderly and diabetic are two words that translate into poor renal functional reserve. Please remember that. And she is not taking established drugs that reduce cardiovascular risk in non-cardiac surgery like she is not on beta blockers and she is not on statins. Having said that, Strategies to reduce cardiac risk in patients with CAD are coronary revascularization free of choice of anesthesia and maintenance of intraoperative hemodynamics and normothermia which Dr. Bala will uh, uh, enlighten us upon. Perioperative pharmacotherapy with beta blockers, statins and alpha agonist. Excellent perioperative analgesia. Now the question to me or from most of the surgeons will ask is whether you would like to revascularize this patient pre-op. Now look, here is an elderly lady who has fallen down, has a fractured neck femur. Let us see the ACC indications of revascularization. ACC indications are, it is a must before or indicated in patients who have stable angina patients who have significant left main disease, three vessel disease or two vessel disease with proximal LED involvement. Now, do we have the data in this patient? We don't have this data in this patient. And it is not recommended, revascularization is not recommended as a routine prophylactic revascularization in patients with stable angina who are going for non-cardiac surgery without the previous parameters, right? Without this, without this kind of disease. So now what we need is a probably should we do a non-invasive testing? That's the next question. Will you like to do any non-invasive testing in this patient pre-op to surgery? Now can I ask the audience which is the best non-invasive testing? Let us see. Let us take an opinion poll. Uh, a dobutamine stress echo, that's a great answer. Any, any other answer? Cardiac CT angio, next, very good answer. Anything else? Sorry? Thallium scan. So, there are three answers which are quite, quite reasonably uh, well spaced. Let me put it this way. Let us talk about CT angio. CT angio gives you an information which is of structural information. We don't want structural information here. We want functional information prior to structural information. We want to know whether she can st stand a stress of surgery. And here, either adenosine stress thallium or a dobutamine stress echo would be a very good. So now, non-invasive testing is recommended in patients with at least two clinical risk factors who have poor functional capacity. What did I say about the functional capacity of this patient? Six and a half meths. So I am just going step by step to tell you that this patient, in my opinion, does not require a preoperative non-invasive evaluation. She has an old stable in fact. She's getting class 2 angina. She can at times wash dishes, do all her domestic activities without angina. Once in a while she goes out also without a problem. So here is a patient who can stand through probably a fracture neck surgery without a problem. But then, had she had a functional capacity of less than 4 meths? Yes, of course. Then this is a beautiful study. 
published in JAMA 2001. And another study which has appeared, I will show you in one of my next cases in 2007, which tells you that there is a fountain here. Okay. Now, uh, if you can see on this side, you have a determined risk score. Assign 1.2, age more than 70, current angina, prior MI, congestive heart failure, CV events, diabetes and renal failure. How many points we have here? How many points we have here? No. We have three points. Current angina, prior MI, diabetes. We have three points. We have three score here. So zero to score three falls a low risk category patient. There is no need really. There is no need really of going anything first. Let us see if we give a, give a score of four, more than three. Then you do dobutamine stress echo. If there is no new wall motion abnormality, proceed with surgery because the event rate is very, very, very low. And across the board, whether you have wall motion or new wall motion abnormalities more than one, one to four segments, from low risk, intermediate risk to moderately high risk. When you are on beta blockers, that is a, this light blue bars, beta blocker use, the event rates are less. And no beta blocker use, the event rates are high. And very high risk patients, whether beta blocker or no beta blocker, event rates are same. They need desperately revascularization pre-op. So this is the message of this slide. So, here is a patient whom I personally would not send for uh, pre-op evaluation. My question to you, Dr. Bala, is what will be your choice of anesthesia in this patient and how will you maintain intraoperative hemodynamics? I think uh, any takers for this question, anybody want to answer for this? What would be your choice? Choice of regional anesthesia in this patient or choice of anesthesia, general versus whatever. How many of you, anyhow, will, uh, I think the options are very clear. How many of you will go for only spinal anesthesia? This is the case. Okay. Can we How many of you will go for uh, a, combined, a combined spinal epidural anesthesia? Oh, excellent. How many of you will go in for ephemeral and sciatic block? Okay, so I think uh, going by the consensus, uh, it became very uh, clear that majority of them prefer a combined spinal epidural technique. I think uh, that would be my answer also. That's the yes. way we do it in combined spinal epidural. And okay. uh, here, uh, fortunately, uh, the cardiologist has been very considerate in putting only tablet aspirin, 75 milligrams. So there is no uh, major confusion as far as the antiplatelet and the epidural insertion. That's number one. So I think the consensus is, and I also agree with that, will be combined spinal epidural. Only thing I would like to emphasize is uh, the way we do it, the combined spinal epidural, we give a very, very low dose of intrathecal uh, VPV 